Good morning and welcome to Highland Church of Christ. We're glad that you can attend this service. We know that all over the country and all over the world, there's a lot of folks that are not able to go and sit in church and, and serve with, with uh, uh, Christians of like mind. But we're glad we'll be able to do this service uh, this morning. We're glad that you have been able to join uh, Highland this morning. Let us begin with a song. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to work. pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, for this day and all your blessings, Lord. We, we give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, we just thank you that you love us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the promises and your word that you give us, O oh Lord. 
And we trust those promises, Heavenly Father, that you have for us. We pray, Father God, for all those, Lord, that are watching this morning. I pray your blessing upon them and their families. I pray, Father, for all those who may be shut in, Lord, who can't get out, that you bless them, Heavenly Father, and be with them and comfort them, Lord. I pray for all those who are sick in in our congregation, Lord, all those who may be suffering in any way, that your hand of blessing may be upon them. Lord God, in these trying times and these times of uncertainty, Lord, We know that we have a certainty with you, and we give you and praise and glory for that through our Lord Jesus. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we just praise you, Father, for it. And we pray that you just forgive us for our sins and bless us in this service this morning, Lord, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. It says there, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. You know, the Lord's Supper, as we take it each Sunday, is a reminder of what Jesus has done for us at the cross. And we're commanded to remember that sacrifice. But it's not just a remembrance that we are taking part in at this point in our worship each Sunday. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time we've ever taken the Lord's Supper, this time this morning as we take the Lord's Supper, and any time we have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper in the future, we're not, not only remembering Jesus' death on the cross, but we're also proclaiming that death to the world around us. Let's think about these things as we pray this morning. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity that, that we have at this point in our worship to uh, think about the cross and to remember the body of Jesus that hung there. Father, we're thankful for his sacrifice and we're thankful for this bread that we're about to take that represents his body. Help us to take that in a worthy manner this morning and help us to not only remember his death, but also proclaim it each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the power that is in the blood of Christ. And we're thankful, Father, that it was shed for us so that we could have the hope that we have of spending eternity with you. Help us as we take this cup this morning to do so in a worthy manner and help us to remember the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us and that cleanses us from all of our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we have the opportunity at this point in our worship to give back to the Lord and support the work that is going on here in this congregation, but also throughout the world. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the blessings of this life, and we're thankful for uh, what you have provided for us so richly. Help us, Father, as we uh, contribute to your work uh, to do so in a cheerful manner. And we pray, Father, that the money that is collected will be uh, used for your glory and used to further your kingdom here on this earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On Zion's
Well, in this particular month, we've been pressing on, deepening our faith, moving forward, but especially thinking about those things in terms of our family life. And so last week, we started out thinking about Jesus and having the right mindset of marriage before we ever even get married. And then we, we talked about stable, having a stable, godly marriage towards the end of that. But what we're doing in this little, short, four-part study is we're thinking about the right mindset before marriage. We're thinking about what Jesus thinks about marriage itself. We're also going to think about raising faithful children. And then we'll close out with the very difficult subject of Jesus and remarriage. But for today, we're thinking about Jesus and the high view of marriage that he actually had and taught about during his life. And so when you, when you approach Jesus really on any subject, what you're going to find in Scripture is that Jesus is very, very different from the world, very different from normal thinking. And I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to matters like what Jesus has to say about money or what Jesus has to say about marriage, we're very, very tempted to ignore him because for most people, uh, we so compartmentalize our lives that Monday through Saturday, we live out our marriage and our money the way that everybody else does because we talk to our friends about it and it's, very, you know, it's, a, it's a very normal process to think on those things. But the truth of the matter is Jesus never wanted us to compartmentalize our lives that way. We desperately, I think, need to hear what Jesus has to say on every subject and maybe more so on marriage than, than we ever thought about. See, if we don't talk about things like this together, we're not going to be much help when we come together uh, in a worship assembly or we engage in, in the Christian life. And so in the church, we often don't seem to know what to say to one another when it comes to, to the life of a marriage. And so a lot of people feel very alone in our churches because they feel like when their marriage struggles, they're struggling alone. For a lot of people who end up being divorced, they feel very, very ashamed about that. And not only do other people not know what to say to them, but they themselves don't know what to say about their situation. And so what I want to say at the outset is I want us in our churches to feel encouragement as a personal responsibility that we need to bring into the lives of one another. See, we need to be able to care for one another in a, in a concerning type of way. Uh, we are the church after all. <laughs> and so we are family and we are spiritually connected to each other and we need to be concerned about each other. But in addition to that, we need to encourage each other with truth. What we don't want to do is encourage each other with the messages of the world. We want to encourage each other with the messages that come directly from Scripture. And so whatever we say about this subject, we approach it knowing there are lots of swirling emotions and, and nearly every situation is unique. And for a lot of people, the, there are a lot of open wounds when it comes to the subject of marriage. A lot of those are still fresh. And so when people approach subjects like this, so the temptation is to, to not listen and to not want to study what Jesus has to say because people feel sorrow, they feel lost, they feel disappointment, they feel shame. So we should and need to be sensitive on this matter because we never ever want to make those wounds worse. And we never want to give the impression that a failed marriage is somehow an unforgivable thing. I think Jesus wants all of us to know that in every aspect of, his, of our, our lives, his words are transforming and they provide for us a new way of life. And there are internal implications to the things that he has to say. And so let us come alongside people who are married, people who are struggling, people who are divorced, and let's come alongside them with love and hope and strength and healing from the lips of Jesus. And so every spouse who struggles in this area, they hurt. Every child who goes through this, they hurt. And to anybody who's ever done anything for which they're ashamed, I want, I want us to know, all of us have sinned. All of us at some point in our lives could have done better. And so let us hurt with those who hurt. So having said all of that, let's humbly listen to Jesus. 
I want to start out by saying something to you you don't want to hear. And that's simply this. Every single marriage is under attack. Every marriage in the Lord's church is under attack. James chapter 4 and verse 7 does not say ignore the devil and he will flee from you. No, resist him. I want you to know your marriage is being assaulted every day by spiritual forces you probably don't know anything about. And so we must flee to Jesus. And I want us, I want us to think about fighting and resisting the devil in all things that could challenge our marriages with the help of Jesus. And so in Matthew chapter 19, we're looking at some words from Jesus in verse 1. It says, when Jesus had finished teaching, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. There's significance to where he is in, in regards to this conversation that's about to take place. But we'll table that uh, for our discussion of Jesus and remarriage in a couple of weeks. Um, because there's an interesting thing about where this takes place. But in verse 2, it says, Large crowds followed him. They always did, and he healed them there. In verse 3, Pharisees came up to him, testing him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus answered, verse 4, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus has a very high view of marriage. And I want us to think about four thoughts. Number one, God created marriage. One of the things Jesus highlights in verse 4, he says, Have you not read that it is God who created them from the beginning, male and female, and said, it's the same God who said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus roots marriage in its origin and in its beginning in Genesis. And so God created a man and a woman, and he brought them together in a union. And he didn't have to create humans in this way. Everybody could have been a cookie cutter of one another. But he, but he did do it this way because he wanted to define marriage from the beginning and to say that he created it this way for our betterment, for our good. Now, the world officially, <laughs> officially denies this. Marriage has been so secularized in the minds of people in our world today. And, and the way that most people in the world think about marriage is they think about it as, as really just kind of a right of life, R-I-T-E, a not a right that you possess, but uh, something that you do. Just everybody does it, you know, and, and anybody who wants to claim it, they can say, hey, let's go get married. And they do so with no thought for God. And in fact, most of them keep God out of marriage. You know, I wonder if you've ever had something that you created or wrote or a work of art or something you worked really, really hard on, and then somebody came in in the last minute and they took it away from you and they changed it fundamentally. If you never had that happen, I think you could probably imagine it happening. How would you feel about that? Well, I want to suggest to you that's what the world has done to marriage because God's original plan was one man for one woman, for one marriage, for one lifetime. And he created it for our good so that we would live it out with equal dignity and complementary roles, and there would be this powerful unity and diversity. One of the biggest problems in marriage throughout history is in treating it like some secular thing everybody does in the midst of their lives. And even if you stood before a preacher even, and even if the vows sounded religious, uh, those vows are not held as something that were promises made before God. And so it's just looked at as secular companionship. And if it doesn't work out, okay, that's almost normal. And in fact, in some very large urban cities, it's almost normal to have a, an ex-wife or an ex-husband. Uh, so marriage has been co-opted by the godless. I don't know how to say that any other way. It's just the truth. And as Christians, we don't need 
uh, any other guidance except for what God has to say about it. And Jesus here is very, very explicit about what he says. And, you know, even in the church, there are some people who've approached this issue in a very secular and worldly way. And maybe they had a worldly mindset when they got married. And I want to just say, therefore, that marriage for a lot of Christians has been less than what it was originally designed to be. And so God created marriage. That's the first thing. Second thing, God designed marriage, this is incredible, as a symbol of his love for us. He didn't just design it so we would have somebody to be with for the rest of our lives. He designed it specifically as a symbol. Before the world began, he made up his mind he was going to create marriage as a symbol of his love for us. And so think about it. God designed marriage as a union between a man and a woman. That's not random. And he made them and he brought them together in marriage. And in doing so, he was painting a picture. Now, most, view, most people view marriage merely as a means of self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction. And you look at, you know, the romantic notion that we get from movies and novels and stories and whatever is that you can look at that other person and say, you complete me. And I just want to say to you, that's nobody's job but Jesus. And it's unfair for us to put that on somebody else. They'll always disappoint you if that's the way you look at it. But marriage is an end in and of itself in this view. And so what I want to say is that the Bible teaches us that God designed marriage as a means to a greater end, to be a picture of something far greater than we ever imagined. And so Paul talks about this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Uh, Paul quotes the very same text Jesus quoted, quoted Genesis 2, 24. A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They become one. But then Paul says this. It's unbelievable. He says, this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so Paul says the purpose of marriage is to point us to a picture of Christ as a husband and the church as a bride. And this picture is being painted on a canvas to the world for the world to see it. And so in Ephesians 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, how are you doing on that? See, a husband is designed by God to be a picture of Jesus' love, a sacrificial and selfless love for the church. And in verse 24, it says, As as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And so a wife is designed by God to be a picture to the world of the church's love for Jesus, a joyful, following, trusting love. It's complementary. And so what we get out of this is that God created marriage, not the world, and he designed marriage as a symbol, surprisingly, as a symbol of his love for us. And the third idea, God created marriage for us to live out the gospel together. So let's build on this. You marry someone, and in your marriage, it's a symbol of Jesus and the church and their love for each other. And the idea is that you renounce everything else in the world that you hold an allegiance to. You know, I think when we think about romance, uh, every romantic excitement is really about you. You're getting the attention. You, You know, it's not really love, it's ego. But the gospel shows us to care for each other, to take care of each other, to say, I'm excited about what God is doing in your life, and I want to be part of that, and I want you to go to heaven, and I want you to help me to get there too. So the idea is that one day we'll stand before the throne of God, and all of our sins and flaws have fallen off, and we'll finally be the people God created us to be, and we'll be absolutely perfect, and we'll be able to look at one another and say, I always knew we could be like this. Philippians 1.6 says, The good work God began in you, He will bring to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. And so God created marriage. He designed it as a symbol of His love for us. He created it so that we would live out the gospel together. And the last idea is this. Marriage must be treated, therefore, as sacred 
and holy. In the words of Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is to be held as sacred by all. And just listen to the words, the seriousness with which Jesus approaches it. In the text we just looked at in Matthew 19, he who created them made them. (laughs) We're answerable to God, Jesus is saying. And then in verse 5, he says, the two shall become one. This is the language of covenant. An agreement that we make promises that we give to one another before God himself. And then in verse 6, he says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So it's a sacred thing. It should be treated as holy. And so let us end by saying, husbands, you are to lay down your life for her. Love her as Jesus loved the church. Lift her up in honor and dignity and beauty and realize what's at stake. Because if you're harsh with her, you are showing to the world that they should expect Jesus to be harsh with the church. If you ignore her, you are shouting to the world that Jesus ignores his bride. If you're unfaithful to her, you're trying to say the same thing about Jesus and his people. And so, husband, what picture of Jesus are you creating in the way that you love your wife? On the other end of it, Wives, realize what's at stake. What picture are you giving to the world and what it means to follow Jesus? If you disrespect your husband, are you saying that the church then should be disrespectful to Jesus? And if you do not pursue your husband, is it Jesus who also is not worth pursuing? And if you're unfaithful to your husband, is it Jesus who's not worthy of our faithfulness? You see, marriage is to be held as sacred and holy, and it is to be seen as a covenant because God has joined it together. And so it's a display of the gospel. Let's show the world God's love for his people. Marriage, by God's definition and design, is sacred. And as Jesus has said, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the